A great topic today for our, our monthly dietitian talk. So we are talking all about teen nutrition. For those of you that don't know, my name is James Marin. I'm an integrated registered dietitian, environmental nutritionist. I'm oh. Delia Marin, certified gastrointestinal nutritionist, one of the co-founders of Married to Health. And we're excited for one of our monthly dietitian talks. So wherever you're tuning in from, we look forward to having you ask questions or just let us know all your thoughts of your teens and what they're doing, what you were doing as a teen. And then we as dietitians, what we're seeing, what we were doing and what we were experiencing as teens. We're excited to be joined by two of our dietitians. We'd love for them to introduce themselves. We'll start with Laura um, and have Laura introduce herself to all of you who don't know her yet. Hello, everyone. My name is Laura. I'm an integrative di uh, registered dietitian here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I uh, specialize in women's health and emotional healing. Go for it, Vicky. Okay. Um, I thought I was muted. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Vicky Schemmer, and I am also an integrative uh, registered dietitian nutritionist in uh, Orange County, California. And I work with young adults who are recovering from substance abuse, um, eating disorders, disordered eating. Uh, and I also work with metabolic issues like insulin resistance and diabetes. Awesome. So we're going to bring many perspectives to this chat, all, all on the sides of, yes, metabolic perspective, emotional perspective, disordered, gut health. All of, all of the above. And we got some really good questions already beforehand from some of our Good Gut members. So we'll be sharing those today. Um, yes. But if anybody else has any questions, pop them in the chat and we'll make sure that we address them. And this topic really came about from really our community, from yes. a Good Gut member, from one of our patients who was like, I really want to know more about teen nutrition. I have a teen or my family and friends have kids who are in that adolescent age range. And man, it's a struggle whether at school, on the go, in college, in high school, junior at high, at home, mm -hmm. of like, what the heck do they eat? How, how do I make sure they're getting enough nutrients? How do I make sure they're eating enough? And the list goes on and on. So we want to just kind of dive into that today. And it's a tricky time of life, right? Because teens are trying to assert more independence and want a little mm -hmm. bit more control over what they're doing. Parents are oftentimes worried that they're not necessarily making the best choices for themselves. So we often see this as a time of power struggle. And also, and you know, Vicki, you can speak more to this, Laura, you can probably speak more to this. We see it as a time of a lot of nutrition struggle. And then teens really trying to control the situation by maybe engaging in disordered eating behaviors. There's this statistic that did show that, um, dieting was really common amongst teens a poll of both uh, boys and girls of high school age showed that 57% of high school age girls were on a diet. 36% um, of boys were on a diet, both trying to lose weight. And w another poll showed one in five children between the ages of six and 18. So, you know, Beyond. one in five. So 20% yeah. of them demonstrated disordered eating behaviors and eating disorders. Um, so, you know, we do know that this is common, but I think it's so important to empower kids and not necessarily use tool, use food as kind of a, an authoritarian uh, tool, but we'd love to hear what you all experience. I know, you know, some of us work with kids, Vicki, you have some great experience. So we'd love Vicki to hear what you see, what you hear amongst your population and just some of these tools we can teach our, our population. Uh, yes, thank you so much, guys. Uh, thank you, Dahlia, for bringing up that statistics too, uh, mega important. Um, and uh, as I was working with my clients today, I had another rehab reached out to me to actually do consulting for young males as well, because we do start seeing that pattern, unfortunately, a little more often. Um, and what do I hear from my young adult clients who are, um, you know, between the ages of 18, and 25 is that um, social media has a strong impact on them, um, unfortunately. And that's where I do a lot of my work. So we try to focus on the positive instead of uh, unrealistic um, images that are being posted mm -hmm. there. Um, and all the influencers that are not doing a great service to our 
young adults, right, and teens. Uh, and one of my clients today, she brought up a valid point. She said, I wish when I was in high school, my parents would not micromanage me that much hmm. because that set me on more of a resentment pattern and I wanted to be more defiant. And the more my mom told me, you should eat more carrots and more broccoli, I wanted to do the opposite. So also my thing is that if I had a teen right now, you know, in my household, I would also, I would provide everything that I believe that a parent needs to provide and that should be in the fridge in the pantry and make it known. But I would also give them trust, right? To, to, to put some trust into them that they will make the right decision and maybe center it around uh, well-balanced family dinners without any type of criticism. Oh, what's on your plate? Right. So if a parent is providing, I don't know, a green salad, roasted vegetables, and then a source of protein and a source of carbohydrate, let that teen be in charge of what will be on their plate instead of shoving something on their plate. Right. Or saying, oh, why are you eating so many, so much of mashed potatoes, for example. Hmm. Right. Uh, so that's, you know, that's something that I would like to for the parents to pay maybe more attention to we're trying to do the best we can as parents right but we also probably need to understand and this is another thing i heard from my client today oh two siblings from two parents from you know the same mother and father can be different they can have a different character uh different level of receptivity and sensitivity so i feel like that needs to be also um in the parents attention Absolutely. How they're presenting things, what they're presenting, and, you know, really just knowing their roles. Um, you know, I know we as dietitians teach this, especially to our families, but I really wish more people really understood that division of responsibility, whether it is for a two-year-old or a 17-year-old, I really think it's the same thing. And we know that a fellow dietitian, Ellen Satter, created this division of responsibility that really says parents, caregivers, all we're in charge of is what is purchased, right? Because especially if it's a younger teen, they're 13, 14, they're usually not working, driving, or picking up whatever this undesirable food is in the home that the parent's criticizing them for eating. So really parents, we're in charge of what food is purchased and served and where. That decision absolutely can be made together and we can inquire with the child, hey, what do you want to eat? What are you in the mood for? Or does this sound good to you? These are the two options for dinner. Which one sounds good? And as Vicki mentioned, they contain whole foods. But really, then we're trusting the kids to listen to their bodies because we're not in charge of what they actually end up eating and how much they eat. So that needs to be up to the child. The child needs to have that autonomy and that respect to be able to say, hey, this is how much mashed potato I want. This is how much carrot. This is how much protein I want. You did your job. Now let me do mine. Because like you said, Vicki, then it ends up bringing in resentment. It ends up being a power struggle. It ends up bringing in things that I think well-intentioned parents don't really realize that they're bringing in. Um, and, you know, I was one of those teens where my parents commented a lot on what I ate, how I ate, how much I ate, what I didn't eat, what I was eating. And I was, it was just like, why is this here then? If you don't want me eating it, why did you buy it? Um, so there was a lot of that. And I want to comment on that, like it really, just to comment on a hierarchy, I know we've been really focusing on a hierarchy, we posted on on our Instagram recently about it, we t speak about it a lot with patients. And even in our family, we follow a hierarchy and really, you know, healthy teen nutrition starts with actually healthy parents, right? So if we want to go way back where where a healthy teen comes from is a healthy prenatal experience, right? So a healthy woman and a healthy parent. And then it comes from a healthy baby and then a healthy toddler and then a healthy child. And then you have a healthy teen, but it's okay. If, if you feel like, oh, wow, I'm just kind of realizing like, oh man, I, I need to maybe better the nutrition in the household or my husband and I, or, or whatever the family looks like, we're starting to eat better. And we have a teen who's now we're trying to influence them to do the same. That's great. 
Uh, but understand whether you're watching this and you you're pregnant, trying to get pregnant, you don't even you're not even married, but eventually you want to have a family. And you're like, I want a healthy teen. Eventually, it does start now, right? So if your habits can align with what you want your habits for your teen to look like, that's great. That is a wonderful first step. You are the role model for your teen. You're setting the tone in in your household chances are your teen still lives in your household so like dahlia mentioned the foods and options that are there you are controlling that but where your control ends and this gets now to what dahlia brought up is you're not forcing them to eat things you're not telling them what to put on their plate you're just providing a great environment a great example a great role model and then they can take it from there, right? Then you're kind of giving that trust. It's it's a two-way street. It's a back and forth conversation, not a dictatorship, or hopefully not. And it's super important to understand that with food because then you can cross the line into that disordered eating. It, it could become like food fear and, and food disorder and binge, yeah, eating, binge right? eating and the list goes on and on. And I can relate to that. I was a binge eater. I would eat my feelings. Uh, when my parents and my family life was in disarray, I could always go to my bag of chips and TV and soda and just go to town on that, right? And feel, ah, I feel so much better eating, right? And so we want to avoid that as much as possible. So I would say, yeah, providing that safe and healthy food environment. And then, you know, uh, parents, be really honest with the emotional environment that you're providing in your home as well, because that ultimately will impact food choices. And there's no better person to speak on the emotional environment or, you know, emotional relationship with food as well than Vicki and Laura. But we'd love, Laura, to hear your thoughts on some of this. So I just wanted to echo kind of like what was already said. <laughs> it was pretty thorough as I was just hearing. But I think one thing that came through me was leading by example. Uh, we get past not only genes, but also our habits and our food rules, own food rules, you know, like as a parent, if you have a food rule yourself, you're gonna, you know, your children are gonna be seeing that even if you don't say it, mm -hmm. even if you don't just, you know, like they're very, they're absorbing. They're usually gonna be like seeing the pe person that is the caregiver and, they usually hang out with these people the most so they're gonna be doing the same that the caregiver is, is is you know doing and i think what i have to say on that and to add is sometimes we get into moralizing foods and i see this often with adults too and at the end it's kind of like well how do you break the cycle because okay we have now teens but like it started maybe you know with the mother or even before that with the grandmother and back, 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 back in generations. And it's like, when do you, when do you break the cycle of, you know, food is not only, you know, nourishment, food is also culture, food is also connection and social engagement. Food is also to be enjoyed. You know, it's like, we keep hearing messages also like, this is bad, this is good. You shouldn't eat these, you shouldn't eat that. And even with dietitians out there, you know, like there's people that really gets very hyper focused on you should never drink a soda or you should mm. never go with like chips or uh, highly processed, you know. It's like I understand where this is coming from. And also, it's like it's not realistic to the world that we're living in where there's just so much available to us. And it's not about you know, eating the whole thing or not eating at all, but it's just finding a, a balance that works for each individual within their body. And if you're able to find this food freedom at the end, where you trust yourself, where you can like, you know what, I'm feeling like a cookie. I can eat the cookie and enjoy it mindfully and really engage all of the senses. Because again, it comes back to as humans, we came here to experience and when we experience fully our food we allow our bodies to like hormonally check into like okay am i hungry do i want more also like you're engaging all of your senses your taste the texture how it sounds and it's like a different relationship with this food that is just you know it's, you're just like taking the whole environment it's just um it's just 
yeah, it's just a, a different way of like looking into food. And I think many of us need to shift our relationship. And even myself, I had, I had distorted thoughts about food and rules that were unconscious. And I was a little bit like blind spots to me until, you know, I got mirrored and then I had to check on myself. It's like, okay, I got to do some work because there's restriction and why is that, you know? Mm. So. Mm -hmm. I want to highlight a comment that just came in. Um, so social media really plays a part in this. So many creators do the bad, the good thing. No oatmeal, for example. <laughs> Teens consume so much from socials with incorrect info. Yes. So it's it's it is. I mean, we commented on the whole hating on oatmeal, which is like it's crazy. We live in a world where we have to defend oatmeal, right? And and I get it. There's issues. Our food system isn't perfect. Like there's pesticides and organic, and we can get into all that. And so it's important though to understand that oatmeal is a great food though, right? We're not trying to demonize and go, no oatmeal, oatmeal bad, and, and just play this black and white game. Like it's just so simple, right? So these foods are bad. These foods are good, right? It, it's, it's way more complex. There's way more context and everyone's different and unique and we need an individualized approach. And that's not really conveyed through social media, especially when a teen is consuming lots of social media. So mm -hmm. it can get very hairy very quickly. <laughs> Uh, Laura, I wanted to echo what you mentioned today that, you know, food is not just like nourishment and stuff, right? Food is also, um, so sorry about the background noise, but food is also emotions, right? And this is what I was talking today to, you know, one of my clients, um, that emotional eating is something we all do sometimes. And it may trigger certain, you know, uh, guilt, maybe, um, fear of falling back into some kind of a binge eating especially with the population that i'm working but i'm also trying to normalize that that occasional comfort at during challenging times of either doing you know trauma therapy or um just you know rough times that some young adults may be falling on some comfort food can actually be something that can give us that support at that given moment when we're not emotionally regulated. So mm -hmm. just chime in into what Lara was saying. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, add in that additional emotion of fear of that influencer who has a lot of followers, right. Who a teen wouldn't understand maybe isn't qualified to speak on nutrition. They, I, I think a lot of teens think that like, Oh, that person has a check Mark or they have a lot of followers. They are, authority, right? They're authoritative. I should follow what they say because obviously they're successful in their minds. Mm -hmm. And so it, it really is just kind of learning. Okay. Hopefully they're able to trust their parents on what their parents are teaching them because they feel comfortable and confident that they're living in a healthy environment. And then, you know, we're teaching them, hopefully parents are teaching them, okay, that person does not, is not qualified to speak on nutrition. So just because, you know, Brittany123 looks really cute and, you know, shares her breakfast smoothie with you, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be drinking that smoothie or that she really is qualified to speak on that. Um, and I know when I worked in, I worked in a pediatrician's office and it was actually more of a lifestyle practice where it was just the pediatrician, dietitian's personal trainer parents would often bring their kids in for me to shame their child. So they brought them in thinking I'm the food police and they'd be like, he eats this. They would be telling on their kids, he eats this and this. T tell him, you tell him, tell him that he shouldn't eat that. And I was like, girl, who bought that? <laughs> like, he doesn't work. So I'm not doing that, right? You want to teach your kids that these are trustworthy sources. You should follow dietitians. You should follow well-educated healthcare professionals for them to be acquiring nutrition information from. And you should also do the same as their parents. So that way you can provide that safe and healthy space at home to begin with. Um, so yes, social media can tend to be just such an, it can be such a wealth of knowledge, but such an instigator of mis 
misinformation. And, you know, someone's even saying, I imagine it even more challenging as a preteen or teen now, because I know when I was a teen, I had no idea what diet culture was. And now teens have all this info to sift mm -hmm. through. So sometimes, yeah, they don't even know that diet culture is out there or that they're falling prey to it. And I think we can all relate to that. You know, Laura, you shared, you had some unconscious beliefs you had to really dive into and maybe unlearn to assess your own relationship with food. And I think teens really fall into that trap really easily where they're like, oh, that that one guy said oatmeal is bad for me. So now I, I think that that's true. Um, but yeah, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this or what you're seeing, Vicki or, you know, Laura as well from just what teens are seeing that are out there on social media. And then we have some questions from a teen as well. I think there's a lot of learning to do, you know, it's just not just social media. It's like everywhere, <laughs> you know, commercials, um, <laughs> uh, products for head, skin. It's like they're portraying this image that you have to follow and that's how you should be looking. And so it it is challenging. <laughs> it is challenging. It, it is challenging and and yeah, I saw you were gonna say something, Vicky. You said there's learning to do and um, you know, something just uh, swooshed through my head was and there is some unlearning to do basically, mm -hmm. which is can I just unlearn everything that social media is trying to shower me with, right? And really get into that headspace that I may need a professional advice, right? And maybe, you know, for parents as well too, because what I hear from my young adult clients is that my mom would always be critical of her body. She would stand in front of the mirror and say, mm -hmm. I'm fat, I need to lose weight. Um, and then that would, without even kind of um, being conscious that a young child may be hearing her at that moment, right? And I think it's more uh, lens on the females, uh, young girls' ears. Um, so yeah, I do, I do hear that often. So the voice that we hear our parents talking to themselves may eventually become our own voice inner voice, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So to be cautious of that. Very much. Or, you know, even parents saying things like, oh, I can't eat that. I'm on a diet. Um, what are we teaching our kids that sometimes we are mindful of what we eat because we're in a restricted time period of nourishing our body. And then other times we shouldn't do that. So I, I love what you're saying, Vicki. And I think that that's so, so, so important just to be as parents, really mindful of how we're talking about food, how we're talking about our bodies and our movement and things like that. You know, how are you addressing exercise in your life? Are you, you know, a parent who's like, oh, I, I have to go to five spin classes this week because I really need to lose weight? Or are you joyfully moving your body and showing your kids that movement is a really good practice for not just your physical body, your mental health, your emotional health, and and so much more. So it's really, again, as parents kind of checking ourselves and saying, how are we talking about these things? And who is listening, watching, and observing and absorbing? And I see, yes, we are live chat, and I see questions. This is replayed on the Married Health YouTube, as well as Facebook, wherever you're finding this, Instagram. this will be replayed as well. So I see those questions popping in and important context here, because we're talking about teen nutrition in this phase is puberty. Okay. It's, it's mm. one of the, if not one of, if not the largest hyper growth phases of our lifetime. And so we see if you're not familiar with pediatric nutrition and, and growth phases and growth cycles, massive growth phase in infancy, right? You can look at an infant one week and they look completely different the next week, right? Mm -hmm. Then again, at three years old, you can look at a three-year-old one month and the next month they look different. So kids are going through rapid growth phases. The next one happens around eight years old where you kind of get in that awkward, we all know that awkward phase you went through in elementary school. It's usually around eight, nine years old. And then you're leading into puberty, which is another rapid growth phase. In these phases- They got awkward too. And you're and you're awkward again at a whole nother level, right? So it's like, but in these phases are massive hormonal shifts that are dictated by our gut microbiome, our blood sugar, the nutrition we have, our environment. So so many factors going in, but it's a very volatile moment. It's like you're 
it's like you're playing with a volcano, right? It's like, you know, the volcano's active and oh, I'm going to throw some dynamite in there or I'm going to create an environment that helps helps with that ecosystem, right? Rather than provoking it. So unfortunately, some kids are in a really healthy ecosystem where they are this, this volcano, so to speak. There's a lot going on. There's things moving and shaking and at any moment, they're going to erupt and change and massively shift the landscape. But um, in other kids, unfortunately, they're they're in an area where there's dynamite going off, where there's lots of uncertainty, and it could kind of really shift that ecosystem. And so this is happening to, to make a real life example. It's when, you know, hormonal shifts are happening and maybe your child isn't hungry that day and they're just not eating. And some parents freak out and they're like, oh my gosh, my, my son, my daughter, they're, they're not eating. So let me, sure they want ice cream. They ask for ice cream. I'm just going to give them the ice cream. They, they didn't want to eat the dinner I made. So I'm going to give them those nuggets and fries, you know, whether it's fast food or from the freezer. And we start to kind of have this uncertainty within ourselves, not realizing that, hey, because of this massive growth phase, you're going to have these ebbs and flows. It's very normal. One day they eat more than you, and then the next day they're eating nothing, right? And it's because of the massive hormonal shifts that are happening. So understanding that context is very important. It's part of this teen nutrition dynamic, even just you know pediatric nutrition in general. And so it's important that you you kind of stay calm and steady, even though maybe your child or your teen is kind of going through these peaks and valleys and it's it's pretty turbulent for them. If you're calm and steady, it makes those turbulent times a little less crazy, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So wanted to give that. And then we have, yeah, some some great questions coming in too. But mm -hmm if anyone wants to comment on that. But. And, you know, again, I think it's just how you're approaching that conversation of, okay, you are in this massive growth phase and, you know, these fun foods, we can have them at certain times. And this is nutritious for your body, right? We're going to not just talk about eating high fiber items like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, beans, grain, or, you know, and legumes. We're going to not just talk about it. We're going to buy them. We're going to cook them. We're going to serve them. So they're not unfamiliar once a child is in their teenage years or once a person is in their teenage years. Um, because outside of hormones, they're also dealing with a budget that they've never understood before, right? You know, recently my 17, almost, no, he's going to be yeah, 17 this year. My 16 year old nephew said, my friends and I wanted to go out for sushi. And then we realized how expensive it was. So we went to fast food instead. We went to McDonald's. So again, they're, they're <laughs> navigating a lot, right? There's a lot that goes into it. Rides, budget, hormones, cravings, relationship yeah. with food. So we, we need to give our teens credit for just how much they're navigating. Um, and we do have some questions from a teen, a teenage, um, a daughter of one of our patients who has a teenager. And she's asking things like, she would love to know better options when going out to eat with her friends, fast food and popular restaurants. They seem to end up at In-N-Out, Chick-fil-A, Cane's, BF's Tacos, and she knows she can eat a salad, but in the teen population, that doesn't sound so fun. How can she healthy things up and still participate? Hmm. So interesting. It's an interesting question. What are your thoughts initially, Vicki or Laura, on this question? <laughs> I find that some of my clients, they uh, once, you know, they go through certain uh, type of, you know, nutritional education in the groups that uh, I'm leading, they uh, go to Chipotle and they tell, um, the, you know, the, the person at the counter that, could you please add more of that into my bowl? Could you add more guacamole? Could you give me more pico de gallo? And could you just like put my sauce of, you know, other stuff on the side if they know that that would you know have a certain gi reaction and make them feel bloated so they're also exploring what sits well in their digestions mm -hmm. uh, digestion and what doesn't mm -hmm. so yeah being advocating for yourself uh, as you're at the counter even in the fast food place right mm -hmm. and maybe if we know that white bread is something that you know we want to reduce and we want to add uh, like more vegetables into that meal maybe asking them leave the top bun out or just you know leave it there toss it and put some extra vegetables on top 
Um, yeah, I mean, do we need to break our budget, especially, you know, if it's our pocket money when it comes to teens? No, but I find that if we give our kids the right tools of how to navigate their way through these places, they can make better choices. Mm -hmm. Right. And also look for places like I found that some of my clients, they like going to Vibe in Orange County. Right. It's yeah. I want to say it's a little more than a cheaper prices, but it's not as expensive as going to True Food Kitchen, for example. Again, I'm talking local places, guys, as I don't know what we have in other states. Uh, so, yeah, I love that. Absolutely. So just adding, no matter where you and your friend group end up going exactly. out to eat. Exactly. I feel like adding more things will also start balancing other things out, like, I don't know, um, hot pockets or whatever else, those, you know, more ultra processed foods. If we add more, less processed foods, that can balance things out for our team. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it is, it's just continuing to remind of those just those just foundational things you know we don't have a teen our daughter even though she acts like one a lot of the time she's only nine um but it's, it's we've been corner, teaching her it? from you know the time she was conscious basically that okay you're picking a snack that's a great carb that you picked out what's a protein we can pair it with what's a veggie that you want to add to this so she's you know really understanding those foundational basics and then you know hopefully when she is a teen and she goes to a fast food chain that she can say okay this is a protein that i'm gonna pick and this is a you know the bun is my carbohydrate or i'm getting french fries and these are my veggies that I want to pick and there's fat that's in this meal. So they're finding that balance no matter where they go. They're not having to leave it behind because you really can make it what you want to make it. And it takes a certain confidence, right? Especially with the teen, you want to consider that, that, you know, yes, I can confidently say this as a woman in my mid thirties, but it might not be always that easy for a teen to feel confident to speak up and ask, oh, can you give me extra tomatoes? And can you, you know, make that lettuce wrap, whatever it is, or, you know, can I have fries instead of a bun? Um, whatever they want to do, or, you know, can I have a whole grain bun? Um, so it's just infusing that confidence into your children as well. And something I always tell my daughter or my niece is, you're never going to see that person again, probably. So, you know, ask politely, but still make sure that you take care of you. You need to remember that hierarchy. You need to, you know, remember that you matter. And so no matter where your friends want to go, you have these foundational principles and these values that hopefully you feel very confident in. I have something to add on that. Mm -hmm. um, something that I teach a lot to my patients is the 80-20 rule. So... Again, it's not about an extreme of like, well, now every time that I go out with my friends, I have to be conscious and mindful about it. And I have to be really like choosing what I'm going to be eating. Like give yourself some grace and permission mm -hmm. to also just get the burger that you so want with mm -hmm. the two buns, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and just also remembering that you're also eating at home. And whenever you're eating at home, making sure that you're adding also um, vegetables, like you're enough protein, that you're eating enough of fruits. So now it's it's more about the pattern and the trend and not just one meal that will destroy everything. Right. Exactly. And yeah, and I, I would say, yeah, it's really like we are teaching our daughter as well. Like, yeah, there are some restaurants and some fast casual places that, yeah, we can go anytime. Those are like anytime, like yeah. Vibe. If we're talking locally, Kava. shout out to Kava and Chipotle and Vibe and she likes frame, Active flame Culture. She does like Flame Broiler. And those are somewhere it's like, yeah, we're gonna get veggies. And some of those places have great, like really excellent quality. Mm -hmm. And we can go there anytime because those are great healthy choices. And then there's some other places like, look, every now and then her grandfather takes her to in and out and they get French fries. Right. And that's that's a highlight. And that's a once in a while. That's yeah. happening maybe like once a week, if that. So and we're like, OK, that's yeah. that's something they do together. They're having fun. And we try to stay very neutral because we don't want her to think like, oh, the you had french fries it's like okay you know I'm, all right good you enjoyed some because, fun time with your grandpa and you had something you enjoyed and because it does it makes up the rest of her diet and lifestyle is 
not french fries so that tiny little french fry is not going to mess up the rest of her diet and lifestyle now if the rest of her diet and lifestyle was like a french fry right was eating tons of other fast food and hyper processed foods then yeah that's just adding to the oh issues or, or some of the concerns right so it's really having that understanding that balance and really finding that whether that is the 80 20 or just that overall balance that you're finding for you and your family to where the default is health right the default mm -hmm. is a healthy teen the default is feeling healthy and symptom free and you can still have a french fry here and there right and that's not gonna mm -hmm. that's not gonna break you no and that can be part of your your balanced nutrition that you're looking at. So we're just really teaching our kids this, teaching them these foundational basics, giving them that confidence to listen to their bodies and try to assess, okay, what makes me feel great? What doesn't, right? I think for a lot of us, it takes us a long time too, to even understand that like, oh, I don't, my stomach doesn't feel well when I eat that certain food. And you know, my skin reacts maybe when I have certain things. So having that confidence, really reflecting on, okay, do I feel amazing when I have this? Maybe I'm going to have a little bit less of it if I don't, or it's not going to be, you know, as much of a staple. So I think this, these are great tips that we're giving. And, you know, we have someone saying their teen is listening and appreciating this conversation, which I love. I love. And one thing that, you know, that, that uh, question that we got was food for your mood. Friends are talking mm. a lot about this, which I love. When I was a teen, no one talked about food for your mood. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I love that teens are now aware food for your mood. That's awesome. Um, friends are talking a lot about this with our teens as they are all over the map. Um, so yeah, how can we support them with puberty changes, stress, and you know that good food, good mood concept that's out there. We really want our teens to feel confident in good food, good mood. And Laura, just emotionally speaking, how do you feel like sometimes that line gets blurred with, you know, I think the intent of that statement, good food, good mood is nourishing foods can help with your gut and your gut bugs producing certain hormones and neurotransmitters that get sent up to your brain and give you maybe more of these good mood types of hormones and neurotransmitters, maybe a little bit more serotonin, which calms you out, or GABA, uh, which also helps create that calm and decrease anxiety. Maybe some foods give you more dopamine, which makes you feel happier. Um, some foods might raise your adrenaline and your cortisol, which might make you feel a little bit anxious. So how are you seeing kind of that differentiation between good food, good mood, and then comfort eating where people are dopamine seeking, where they're just saying quality is not what I'm relating this food to. It's do I get more happiness temporarily from this food? And maybe if that was one of your good mood foods, but maybe you weren't using it in the healthiest way, how can somebody transform that to kind of balance it out to still, you know, have foods they enjoy, but maybe not comfort eat with them? Yeah, so um, it's, it's a complex topic because, again, it's like, how do you define that line? It's such a, like, thin line. Mm -hmm. And I think what you mentioned is really important that it's, it's about eating enough adequate, adequate materials because without adequate materials, then the bodies cannot perform or even function properly. And sometimes this can, you know, cause our tummies to kind of, like, get, like, hurt. And then that can lead to uh, maybe now our mind is not as clear, maybe a little bit foggy and, or vice versa. We're having a hard time. We're going through puberty. There's just a lot of insecurity, self-doubt, all of these emotions that now we're suddenly feeling. Um, we're, we're embarrassed about everything. We have our bodies are changing very like uh, significantly. So mm -hmm. everything, all of these little like things have an impact in our you know nervous system and then that can also impact our gut and our tummies right. and um i think yeah it's about again it's like well it's just knowing a little bit about educating first you know like okay well i'm feeling like i want a donut right <laughs> and the donut you know, it has many different types of ingredients in the donut, right? Um, but if I know I'm going to have a donut, maybe I can use a little bit of a strategy to help my blood glucose be balanced. So then maybe in, before I eat my donut, maybe I can have um, a little bit of 
coconut yogurt with a little bit of like like heavy on protein and uh, maybe like a few slices of avocado or maybe something pre the donut <laughs> to balance that out. Because when you have protein and fats with a fiber, then when once you receive the donut, then the, the sugars are not going to get to the bloodstream as quickly. So, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Well, no, and, and I was going to say like, you know, and understanding what what is the food, right? Like like you're saying, Laura, like are you are you hungry and you're eating a donut like to eat and, and satisfy, then you're likely gonna eat three or four donuts. Cause if you're using that as a meal, like that's not gonna work out well, right? Are you using the donut to then get a dopamine hit that you're you're just trying to get this dopamine? Or like I think the question was asking as well is like what foods actually help with your mood, right? Like we know nuts and seeds surprise, surprise, a lot of plant-based foods are great for your mood, right? They're balancing your gut microbiome, they're balancing your blood sugar, things like nuts and seeds that are high in omega-3s, berries, you know, um, beans, peas, and lentils are great. You're getting phytonutrients and fiber and protein and these healthy carbohydrates that really just elevate your gut microbiome, which elevates your neurotransmitters, and then you're getting this healthy, steady supply of great neurotransmitters so you're in a wonderful mood and then if you you know the opposite of that i think and what we're seeing a lot especially in the us and the standard american diet is i'm going to elevate my my mood with cheesecake and soda and tons of caffeine whether that's in the energy drink or six cups of coffee and we're constantly just trying to like it's almost like trying to hotwire a car versus start a car in a healthy way right it's like you want to start your car and have it run really well versus like you're just trying to hot, hot wire the car and force it to run well even though the check engine light's been on for two years and you're just really trying to push it and make it do something that hey i, I can't do this right now right so they're very different things and so yeah every day you have a choice i mean really that's where it came from heal with each meal and feel with each meal and all these kind of taglines we have, it's really coming from what you're doing every single day can just help maintain that car. So whenever you turn the engine, you know, oh man, my car is going to run, it's going to run smooth, and it's always going to be reliable versus having to jumpstart or hotwire or, you know, really force your car to run with some of these foods that are highly questionable, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, it's... Or not. I would say, you know, I, I want to say hyper processed, ultra processed, right? Might, they might not have that protein, that fat and that fiber that Laura was talking about. So if this food that you're going to have doesn't have that, add it like Laura is saying. Mm -hmm. So you're still getting that same blood sugar balance. You're still satisfied and you're not over in overdrive with your emotions and your brain, right? You want to set your body up for success. You want to set your brain up for success. And we know just hyper refined grains. So kind of one of my kind of telltale signs, if a grain is hyper refined, even if you haven't yet learned how to read labels is if it melts in your mouth, you can kind of just suck on it like a goldfish cracker or something like that. There's probably no fiber in there, right? You're thinking of if you are talking about veggies or fruits, when you have to chew them a lot and your teeth need to do a lot of work to break down the fiber, that's a sign that there is a lot of fiber in that food. Kind of use that as your barometer. How much do I have to chew it? Um, if there's something that you're eating that you really could very well probably swallow and, me and not choke on it, um, there's probably not a lot of that good mood fiber in there. Um, so that might be something you add if it's not inherently there in the food, if, you know, we're talking about that donut example. So just thinking of how to pair these things, right? So that way we're not saying instead of, we're saying in addition to, it's not an or, it's an and, because I don't think you always have to make these or choices or make yourself feel guilty. Um, enjoy your donut and still have a great mood. I was also wanted to add, it's like, I think something that I see a lot with teens is, and even when I was a teen myself, we don't eat enough. Mm. Like, or I should say enough of the macronutrients and micronutrients in the right combination so that hormones are happy as well. Especially I can speak as a woman, 
because we have such a special body in a way that we're cycling depending on the month mm -hmm. and we require certain you know nutrients more than perhaps men mm -hmm. um so making sure that you're eating enough protein that you're eating enough and that you're having your three meals like really solid meals will really set you up for success um, especially with your hormones because if you don't have enough material then we're going to start seeing issues with you know hormones and then you're going to have like um you know as the cycle goes that can also affect the mood of a teen if we're not eating enough we might be a little bit more irritable and if you're sometimes you've heard probably i'm hangry you know mm. that might be just like checking you know like well have i eaten today some sometimes i just forgot you know sometimes i wouldn't eat enough and uh, it really took a lot of like awareness to realize that first i wasn't eating enough and was what i was eating was not balanced enough to like get enough of my fiber enough of my fat enough of my protein um and i think it's very important when it comes to uh the development of hormones for healthy hormones for men and women um so yeah eating enough is a big one yeah and i think it's so important to teach our kids there's a difference between being fed and being nourished right because we can mm -hmm. eat certain things but maybe not feel that satisfaction and feel that nourishment from just balanced meals and even balanced snacks and i'm not saying that some of those a little bit more processed um, snacks can't fit as part of those things, right? We could still have those melt in your mouth types of carbohydrates and pair them with protein and fiber and fat. So that way we're nourished and we're satisfied and we're not just eating without feeling like I'm still, I am ha still hangry, even though I just ate. Um, Cause I think a lot of parents are often like, Oh, they just eat so much, but how nourished are they? right? Are they eating things that are nourishing their bodies, nourishing their hormones that you're talking about, nourishing them? Um, and we, we're asked for a couple of solid examples. So um, I'd love to share our examples. And then we have a video to share from one of our pediatric dietitians, Damaris, as well, where she shares more examples. And then if you guys um, wait till the end, we're going to also show where you can get a free download of yes. these examples. So and some ideas. Yes. So we, you know, we're being asked teen improved snacks, quick handheld breakfast as they leave mm. for school so early on the go, and then some packed lunches that they can bring. So if the school food options aren't as uh, you know, amazing or nourishing as we'd want them to be, how can they be packing for the day? Um, and you know, I hear it a lot from my teens that they don't want to eat breakfast, maybe especially if they're starting really early in the day, they have zero period and it's six o'clock in the morning and they're just not hungry at that time. Um, I think that's fine to listen to your body. And if you're not going to eat that first thing in the morning, because that's too early for your personal body, still bring something for when you are hungry. If you do get hungry around nine o'clock and you have a break really quickly, bring something, again, a good protein, fat, and fiber carbohydrate that you can be eating at that time. Whether that is something like, you know, our daughter will grab quick breakfast oftentimes. Like this morning, she had a whole grain toast with peanut butter and some fruit in it. So she had carbohydrates with her fruit and her toast. There was fiber in them. There was fat and some protein in the nut butter as well. And she might have some soy milk with it. Um, so that's a quick kind of handheld grab. Um, you could bring a little wrap with you if you want to stick that in your backpack. I know it's not cool to bring a lunchbox, but you could still stick these things in your backpack. Um, All the teens love to bring a rolly backpack and a lunchbox to school, right? That's that's the cool thing. Let your dad jokes comments. don't have a place <laughs> in this conversation. Um, but yeah, some of those ideas of just what's a quick fiber, protein, and... Um, you know, healthy fat that they can bring with them. You can even do things like little breakfast cups where you're putting your protein, whether that is a plant protein or whether that is like an egg or something like that, if you're not fully plant-based and, you know, maybe you're bringing, you're bringing some fruit on the side of that. You're maybe bringing a piece of toast, something like that, where you're getting both of those things in. And just some other examples to be really real. I mean, we prepare to even have mornings where we're super rushed. And so we keep yeah. snacks in the car for our daughter. Yes. So we, I make sure I do like a nice trail mix in there where I'll put some like 
really it's unrefined dark chocolate, it, maybe some raisins and cashews and almonds and walnuts. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a nice healthy trail mix. And so there's some mornings we're like, hurry, hurry, we're late. And she has that trail mix. So she's mm -hmm. like, Oh, cool. I mean, some trail mix, she's getting her fats and she's getting protein and she's getting healthy carbs and a nice pick me up dark chocolate happens to be a good mood food mm -hmm. as well. And so, you know, you're getting some of that. So it can be anything in between. And I love the huge chocolate chips that are sweetened mm -hmm. with dates. So that way we know she's not getting this huge energy rush in the morning. That's right. going to kind of offset her her focus and offset her neurotransmitters. So we can do things like that, even of just an emergency kind of backup or even keeping in a nice bar in the backpack as well of, okay, mm -hmm. this is a whole food bar. I love core bars. Um, Shout out to Scout bars. I love yeah, the Scout. Yeah, I love Scout bars as well. Bars. So and those are made with just whole pumpkin seeds that are ground up. So pumpkin seeds are just super great and trace minerals. Mm -hmm. Talk about another good mood food, pumpkin seeds, protein, great trace minerals. And then you're just that bar. So it's just like dates, whatever the flavor, like a chocolate or a cherry, mm -hmm. and then the pumpkin seeds. And it tastes so great. And it has pretty good protein in there. Great yeah. protein. I think if I can add one, it's yeah. not plant based, but yogurt. I think it's yeah. pretty like Greek plain yogurt is pretty high in protein, mm -hmm. it has healthy fats. And sometimes they just sell them very easily in like servings that you can just grab in the morning. You have like maybe like a handful of berries, maybe sprinkle a little bit of like those nuts that uh, James was talking about. And then you have like, you know, your fiber, you have your really high protein and your, your... so it can be simple stuff that it's already ready for you to just grab from the fridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we regularly have like an almond uh, or like forager is a great yogurt. We regularly have in our fridge like a forager, like an almond yogurt. And you're still getting all those cashew great probiotics. Oh, it was cashew. <laughs> I thought it was almond. Cashew-based yogurt. <laughs> and so we're usually doing that. You can even, we throw in like some of our, our protein, protein powder, powder, mix it in. Or peanut butter. Or peanut butter. And then throw in on walnuts and chia seed and berries, you know, whatever fresh fruit you have. And um. Yeah, that's another breakfast for Layla and us is like a nice, it's like a parfait and it really just takes five minutes because you're just, you're just throwing things in and boom, you're ready to go. So it's, it's a really quick and diverse way to get lots of great foods in, in a very fast way. And things to make ahead of time, um, smoothies. I love a good protein smoothie and usually we're making them. We have mason jars in the fridge or we'll put in like a little insulated tumbler, super easy to throw in the backpack as well and just drink that later if that's in a little um, insulated tumbler or overnight oats, you can do the same thing with. So that way, again, maybe you're not hungry super early in the morning, but when you are, you have something balanced for you to eat. Um, mm -hmm. And those things can go for lunch as well. So getting in those carbs, those proteins, those fats. Someone was asking, um, my teenage cousin wants to know where they can learn more about what protein, carbs, and fat sources are. And, you know, we do have a lot of free resources on our website. So um, whether you go under our recipes and you can find recipes that are high in protein, carbs, and healthy fats, or if you go to our website, marytohealth.com, you go to our shop page. Um, we have things like our Good Gut Shopping Guide, which has snack ideas. And these are kind of just a on the go snacks. These aren't things you have to necessarily always keep in your refrigerator. So we have tons of ideas there. That's a free download. Um, and then we also have our good gut A to Z with just some actual recipes in there. So if you did want to know what are some dietitian recommended foods, you can get some of those free resources on our website. We also have our gut health blueprint workbook. Um, so whether you want recipes or you just want things to keep in your pantry, in your car, you can learn more about those on our website too. And we'd love and those to hear are, from- And those are living documents. So we're going to be updating that, especially we have Expo West coming up. We're going to be, yeah. stay tuned guys. If you're not subscribed on our newsletter and blog, we're going to be doing a full review of Expo West, which if you're not familiar, it's organic. It's a natural largest, products expo. Yes, food show. Natural so products. we're going to be seeing what's new, what's great. We always get great ideas, find great brands and See try to bring you. See what food trends are out there. And try to bring you the best quality. Like yes. we're all about quality because quality food means quality teens, quality children, quality health. And that's how you heal with each meal is really that quality and, and what you're eating every single day. So yes, those documents, the Good Gut Shopping Guide gets updated. We want to expand it and definitely there's going to be more added plus a blog to just break down 
all the things we're seeing. But really, that's a great question of the basics, right? Like, what is what is high protein food? What are carbs, and what are, what are some of that? So we even have some um, actually a really great resource on that, which would be let me see where it is really quickly though, um, which would be. Oh, I got to post that. If you guys are on our socials and click in our link, um, it might be the Nutra Edge Kids. Um, that will give you a great breakdown of, of basically vitamins and minerals and carbohydrates and mm -hmm. fats. So Nutra Edge Kids, a uh, link is in our bio and down below. Definitely if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube, one of the links down below is Nutra Edge Kids. So that's really just getting to the basics of protein, like healthy protein sources and fat and carbohydrates and vitamins and minerals. And it, it's really for this age group where your kids can kind of learn, identify. There's even courses course. that you can do uh, with your kids. And it just breaks down like, what are these foods? Where can I find these foods? How can I eat these foods in a fun way? And we can't forget, you can work with a dietitian as well. So Mary Child, all of our dietitians can work with teens. Um, we have Vicki who sees teens regularly. Laura can work with teens. I can work with teens on gut health issues. And then we have Damaris. So Damaris is our resident pediatric dietitian, including teenage years. She works with a lot of teenagers. So Damaris wanted to share some of her favorite tips and tricks with you all. So we're going to share that with you. Hi, friends. I'm Damaris. I'm one of the registered dietitians on the Mary to Health team. And I especially focus on kids, teens, families. So I love to see people like you. <laughs> If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always open for bookings. I take patients over the weekends too. And you can also find me on Instagram at The Plant Transformation. But I thought I would join from outside today. It's a beautiful sunny day as spring rolls around the corner. So don't mind the birds joining me on this live stream. Um, I saw a couple of questions come in and I thought I would address them and just give you some of the tips that I found helpful. When it comes to eating out, what are some places that might be a better option, especially if it's like faster food, you wanting to have a quick meal with your friends and what to do when your friends are inviting you. So I encourage you to be the leader here. Your friends invite you, but you also invite your friends. And so some places, if it's fast food, I like to recommend Chipotle because they usually have whole grain options. They have plant-based protein option. They've got veggies. Everyone can do what they want. And it's a quick meal. It's not a sit down dinner. Another place that's really coming up now is Kava. I love Kava. I have teenage sisters and they love taking their friends to Kava and their friends usually love it. Very similar to Chipotle, but it's like a Mediterranean bowl. Um, they've got like green bases, whole green bases, all kinds of vegetables, lots of different sauces. Really, really good. So check out those two places. I encourage you to be the one who invites your friends. Uh, also consider inviting your friends over to make a meal at home. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that is more fun, even to them, than going out. Um, do a pizza night and see who can decorate their pizza the best. Or have a taco night at home. And honestly, making food with friends is so much fun. So consider that as two things you might not have thought about. Um, another idea is to check out Happy Cow, the app. So that place usually has a lot of plant-based options. And as you have plant-based options, you're always going to include fruits and vegetables, usually whole grains, um, protein, of course. So those are a couple of ideas for there. Then someone else was talking about energy and just some of the struggles of your body's changing. You want to help your brain. Like you're probably coming up to some big exams like the ACT, the SAT, and things like that. What are some things that you can recommend? So one big thing I see a lot is that there's low energy because kids don't have time to eat, quite frankly. And that's a great starting point is just eating. And usually the meal that is skipped the most or there's not enough time is breakfast. Am I right or am I right? <laughs> Probably right. Um, because we just head out the door. Kids, teens usually love to sleep in as I did. And, and there's no time for breakfast. So I recommend that you have breakfast ready to go the night before. Something easy, easy, easy peasy is overnight oats. I have some recipe ideas that make it very, very high protein 
on my plant transformation Instagram, the plant transformation. But some ideas for if you were to do overnight oats is to include yogurt. You can do plant-based yogurt, soy yogurt, for example, instead of just water or milk. Um, that's just going to add some probiotics. It's going to add some protein to your overnight oats. And I also encourage you to add some fruits and some seeds. And um, if not, if you if you see that you you as a teen or your parents see is that you really aren't making priority at all, I recommend that you just have something quick to go. Um, have some nuts on hand. Sometimes they sell the individually packaged ones if you need to eat them in the car. Um, layer bars, a fruit. These are the simplest things that you can do anywhere. And on that note, I highly recommend that those parents who drive around teens all the time, or even teens who already have their own cars, please keep some snacks in the car. <laughs> you will find yourself looking for meals after soccer practice, after, I don't know, dance or band or whatever you're up to. And I highly recommend that you keep some nuts, that you keep some like seaweed, for example, some granola bars. I love Lara bars just because they're very clean, very like um, whole food ingredients. And some fruits if you can, but those are kind of the big things that I've always found helpful. And yeah, remind yourself to take a break and eat, even if it's something quick. Then for lunch at school, Teens can be picky. I recommend that you bring something even if you're from home, even if you don't plan on having the whole lunchbox from at home, you can kind of like add to the lunch that you're provided with at school. And so the things that you're comfortable with at home, just bring them. I would rather you eat than you skip a meal or then opt for fast food on your way home because you didn't have time. So just some ideas to be prepared, be really proactive in those busy, busy teen years where you're up to all the fun stuff. Then foods that help the brain, I wanna remind you of how important omega-3s are and foods that are rich in that. And those would be walnuts, flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds. These are great to add to smoothies. So take your smoothie to the next level. You can also add all of these things to oats, um, overnight oats. I've tried this with teens and they do like it. Um, so consider those things. And I just brought a couple of snacks to show you, some examples of things that might be quick and on the way. Uh, dried fruits, I forgot to mention dried fruits, something great to keep in the car. Here's a huge bag of dried mangoes I got yesterday. Something I recommend is that you choose some that only have the actual fruit as the ingredient and not tons of added sugar because then it can be more like candy. Nuts to keep in the car. If you're not a fan of nuts, I'd rather you eat nuts that are seasoned, like these chili ones or like barbecue seasoned or whatever, than you to eat chips or something like that, right? Dried fruits, got some organic figs here. All these are very nourishing, very high protein, also some healthy fats for your brain, um, and they provide energy. That's sustained release so you're going to be filled for quite a while um candy is a big thing with teens and i want to provide an alternative i've discovered recently that i love um it's not well it is <laughs> sour cran so basically what this is is it's dried cranberries with the addition of some citric acid which makes it nice and sour like those sour patch kids or whatever sour candies you like and then it has some natural flavors that make them very fun. So this is a great candy alternative if you can keep them on hand. And what I like about this is it has tons of fiber. So for one bag, this has about 30 grams of fiber, which is really good for your gut. And it has very little sugar for this entire bag. It has like about one and a half teaspoons. Still has some sugar, but much better than candy. So I hope those recommendations are helpful. If you ever have any questions, please reach out to me. You know where to find me. I'm with the Married to Health team. Um, I'm always open to patients and you can also check me out at The Plant Transformation. Take care and I hope that you enjoy the change of season as spring rolls around.
always fun hearing from Damaris, all of our dietitians. She's always a ray of sunshine. That was a great um, summary. Like we didn't yes. plan that at all. Like she, so, we didn't she's watch on it before. the same yes. vibe and summarized everything we said. So that was perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and if I can just give a few kind of parting thoughts, parting comments, <laughs> excuse me. It's, you know, parents of teens, I would encourage you to either help your teen find a cookbook they really like or identify a few websites of just nourishing recipes that can become go-tos for you and your teen. I love Damaris's idea of inviting your friends over and cooking together and just fostering that skill with one another. So whether that's them saying, I love plant you, I love Mary Tilt's recipes, I love, you know, whoever's recipes, um, these are my go-tos that I, I really have. And that way they can share them with their friends too, because Shout out Plant You. Yeah, she yeah. has great ones. But lots of great websites out there. And, you know, parents, I would say I would encourage you just um, really encourage your kids to look at plant forward recipes. They don't have to be plant based recipes, especially if your family isn't plant based, but just ones that teach them how to eat plants. Um, so those would be my kind of parting thoughts. Uh, Laura, James, I'd love to hear your parting thoughts before we wrap it up. I feel like we could always talk forever, uh, but we can't. <laughs> Yeah, no thoughts. I think we kind of mentioned it all. I think kind of covered in a lot. An hour. And yeah. Damaris just kind of put the cherry on top of everything, just kind of summarizing everything very nicely. Um, Love it. And like what you were saying, actually, Dahlia, like uh, when you follow these recipes, like even if they're plant based mm -hmm. and if you're not, you mm -hmm. can just add whatever. Mm -hmm. But you still have the recipe and the bait of the, of the plate and the meal. And you just add the rest. My my parting thought will be answering this question because I love it. Uh, what is the best way to sweeten overnight oats so the kids will eat it? Honey, Stevia. <laughs> uh, my favorite way is when you do the overnight oats, you throw in a couple of dates or even one date is enough. It'll absorb as well. It'll get nice and gooey. And dates are 60% sweeter than cake frosting. And they're also super high in minerals. So they actually can help with your pancreatic function and blood sugar long term so great or studies on that keep and some date gut. paste in your refrigerator date parent paste. you can just blend dates with water and that could be a, a great way to sweeten things up use your fruit Good too date. and just continue Banana. to teach your kids how to heal with each meal and feel with each meal right we don't want your kid to be that one in five who have that disordered eating pattern or an eating disorder we don't want your kids to be those 30 to 50% of kids who are on a diet, we just want them to learn how to heal with each meal, nurse themselves, teach their friends. Damaris really encouraged your kids. They can be the leader, especially if they have great parents who are encouraging them to learn about nutrition from the start, hopefully. So mm -hmm. thank you for being with us. Thank you guys. Stay tuned. Uh, again, Do you have any other topics? Yeah. We any topics, feel free to contact us through our website, marytalk.com comment down below, like and share. Uh, lots of great things coming up, guys. Really great talks, more lives. Our Good Gut Live and our Dietitian Talk are two lives we do every single month. So make sure you're subscribed and you're following us. Lots of great things coming. Our Good Gut SIBO IBS program is coming. So make sure you're on our email list down below. Yes. Super mm -hmm. comprehensive if you're having candida, IBS, SIBO, histamine issues, histamine issues and you really want a hands-on guided approach that is what's coming. So thank you all so much. Heal with each meal. Thank you, Laura. Have a great weekend. Thank yes. you to Laura. Thank you, and guys. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. We'll see everyone see soon. soon.